You have heard over the years that you need to create demand for your products and services. And it comes as no surprise to you that marketing has changed over the past few years. And no matter how much money you throw at a problem or try to advertise, it's not working as well. And you must be wondering, so what do we do? Because we do need to market our services to actually get clients into the door. And this final installment of the Revenue Acceleration Masterclass um, series is going to be discussing creating demand. And the particular reason why I want to discuss creating demand is that I don't think there's enough conversation around the components of creating demand. And this is what we are going to be discussing within this video, within this podcast, if you are listening to this. If you are new to me, I am Tanya. I'm a business growth architect aka Rave Ops, and I work with tech startup and consultancies in your revenue to grow their market share using digital channels. And today I'm going to be talking about something that I have to deal with most of the time when I'm working with clients, and I'm going to give you a particular insight around creating demand and why and how you should approach creating demand, especially when you are at the growth and scale at stage. If anything that I'm saying today is like, oh my gosh, it gives you light bulb moment, feel free to book a consultation with myself or my team in the description box. Also feel free to check out a number of resources that we have left um, in the comments, uh, in the description box, which are some articles that we have published on our blogs as well as our publication, Business Creed Magazine Digital. You can find us on Google as well. And you will have access to a number of resources that we put out on a weekly basis to help you build your business and your startup. On this note, let's jump into this video. This is Biz Talk with Tanya, brought to you by Wiz Digital Academy, a show for business athletes and online bosses who are ready to take up. So welcome to the third installment of the Revenue Acceleration series. And this is all about creating demand in the market for tech startups and consulting firms, and especially if you are in the growth and scale-up stage in your business. So I am not covering niching down because I assume that you are you already know that because you are at a growth stage and scaling up. And I will leave the link to part one up here. You'll see it in your screen as well as part two, but also in the description box for your convenience. Um, I am going to make the arguments for you to give me your time in the next five minutes. But if this area of is of interest to you, we have a workshop, 50 minute workshop, where we walk you through the revenue acceleration formula and how you can accelerate revenue growth in your business. That will be in the description box. And if anything we say here feels interesting, feel free to book a consultation with myself or my team. We have worked with startups as well as consulting firms, and we would love to speak with you. So, in order for me to make my case, I want you to introduce. I want to introduce you to a couple of people. I want you to meet Nikki, who's a cybersecurity expert. So, Nikki has dreamt of creating a safe digital environment for businesses to thrive without fear of cybersecurity attacks. So, she recognized the increasing importance of protecting businesses and individuals from digital threats. Starting a boutique cybersecurity firm meant having the opportunity to make a difference. In the lives of her clients, Nikki envisioned creating a safe digital environment for businesses to thrive without fear. The thrill of being at the forefront of cybersecurity advancement and safeguarding critical information propelled her forward. With unwavering enthusiasm, Nikki established a boutique cybersecurity firm ready to shield businesses from the ever evolving threat of the digital realm. Now, this is not new because most companies don't have that in place. As Nikki Boutique's cybersecurity firm grew, she faced a significant challenge. She relied heavily on responding to requests for proposals to attract new clients. While RFPs provided opportunities, they often led to price-driven competition. We all know that. I hate them. Limiting her ability to showcase the unique value her firm offered, Nikki recognized that she needed to transition away from relying solely on RFPs and find a way to create demand for her services. The thought of breaking away from the familiar territory of RFPs stirred a mix of excitement and apprehension in Nikki's heart. I've seen this in most of my clients. She knew it was a crucial, a crucial step for her firm's growth, but it also felt like venturing into uncharted waters. She realized that by proactively reaching out to potential clients and demonstrating the value of her expertise, she could create a demand for cybersecurity services. She wanted businesses to recognize the importance 
of proactive cybersecurity measures and not wait for a crisis to strike. Instead of waiting for clients to come to her through RSPs, she discovered the importance of initiating conversations, educating businesses about potential threats, and positioning a firm as a trusted partner in the cybersecurity journey. Her aim was to create a demand for boutique cybersecurity services by showcasing the immense value a firm could bring to the businesses. This is not new and for most businesses if you replace your industry you would if you run a consulting firm this is a scenario that you recognize and before we get into anything else i want you to meet mark mark is a visionary tech enthusiast so he dreams of revolutionizing the banking industry mark observed the challenges people faced with traditional banks long queues complex processes and limited accessibility. You realized that there was a need for a more convenient and inclusive banking solution that leveraged the power of technology. He knew that building such a platform would not be easy, but his passion for technology and his desire to improve people's lives fueled his commitment to make it a reality. He envisioned an online bank that offered seamless user experiences, fast transaction, and personalized services. It would be accessible to anyone with an internet connection, providing financial empowerment to individuals and businesses alike. Mark began laying the foundation of his online bank. He assembled a team of like-minded tech experts who shared his vision. Together, they worked tirelessly to develop a secure and user-friendly platform that would set new standards in the banking industry. As Mark launched his online bank, he faced a significant challenge, competition from well-established banks that had been around for decades. These traditional banks had built a loyal customer base over the years and had extensive brand recognition. It seemed like a daunting task for Mark's online bank to compete with such giants in the industry. He knew that creating a space for his online bank in the market would be an uphill battle. Mark realized that creating demand for his online bank was crucial for standing out amidst the established competition. He understood that relying solely on traditional marketing channels might not be enough. Mark knew he needed to showcase the unique advantages of his online bank and create a compelling narrative that resonated with potential customers. As Mark faced the challenge of competing with banks that had been around for decades, he recognized that creating demand for his online bank was key to gaining traction in the market. Now, you might be thinking, well, these are two different set of people and two different set of businesses. But as you can see, they both need to create demand. And as you can see also, creating demand is industry agnostic. Creating demand is about positioning your services, products, or tech platform as a must-have for your ideal clients and not a nice-to-have. In the case of Mark, it needs to change their behavior. People are used to banking in one particular way, and human nature is comfortable with maintaining the status quo. Making changes is time-consuming, risky, and required to change our brain wiring schemas. People that are on my newsletters would have um, this knowledge around schemas because I've shared it, but if you are not on my, on my newsletter, the link to join will be in the description box, and you will be getting a Saturday, Saturday Biz Lessons um, newsletter every Saturday at 3 p.m. South African time, 9 a.m. Um, Eastern Standard Time, where I share a business lesson from any most of the questions that I receive. So even if we go back to Nikki, Nikki needs to create demand because people are used to only thinking of cyber, sec cyber security when they have an attack, when there's an ransom attack, when there's something happening, when they've been hacked. Whereas, they probably need to think about it before. So, you need to create demand because it's then it gets it into the head, head that, okay, this is necessary, this is not a nice to have, I need to have that. And the simple reason is that marketing has changed. And companies that do not adapt will die. I promise you, mark my word, bet me on it, give me five years, and you will see. In the past, marketing finals were the go-to framework for companies to drive consumers through a linear path for aw from awareness to consideration, and ultimately to purchase. Companies used the, uh, this approach to focus on the unique value proposition of their products or services, aiming to persuade consumers to make a purchase. The funnel was designed to move customers through each stage with the ultimate goal of converting them into paying customers. However, with the rapid growth of the native digital world, and these are the millennials and the Gen Zs, 
This traditional funnel approach is increasingly losing its effectiveness. If you run a business, you have funnels. You know what I'm talking about. Consumers now have greater access to information, a wider network through social media, and the power to share their experiences instantaneously. Think TikTok. Word of mouth recommendation have evolved into digital reviews and social media posts that can reach a global audience in a matter of seconds. As a result, customers have more control over their purchasing decisions, making the traditional final user experience a potential red flag for them. And most businesses have not adapted to that. They are still behind. So if you are watching this already, you are a this is simply because conception of content has changed. How people learn about brands has also changed. So with that enters demand creation. It creates an affinity in a type of buyer to consider using your product, services, or platform to solve their problems. It is about creating a desire in the market to solve the problem that you service with your offers. And now with, with digital, we use a targeted demand generation where usually for, for clients, especially when they are consulting firms, they might be are only working with corporate or government. So we would use a targeted demand generation approach for such businesses. And for tech, uh, tech companies, we mo mostly use the traditional demand creation generation approach. So. Targeted demand generation is a strategic process aimed at identifying and engaging specific segments of the market to generate interest, demand, and ultimately sales. It involves crafting persuasive messaging that resonates with the target audience and leveraging multiple channels to reach them effectively. Now, if you have been in my world long enough, you will understand that I go for an Omni-channel, and our clients will, will know this, omni-channel kind of um, approach in our marketing as well as our clients. And then that engulfs people in the world. And this is called the content ecosystem play, uh, marketing ecosystem, the content marketing ecosystem playbook, pardon me, Mama Mutang got twisted day. And this is a proprietary methodology that we have. And I will leave the link to that video up here for your pleasure so you can have an understanding of that. So what are the components of demand generation? The components of demand generations are ideal clients narrative, which is usually the storytelling um, part where it's like, okay, this is why you should work with us. So we leverage storytelling in this and then messaging and content. And most of the time when people come to us, they're like, oh my gosh, my content is not working and everything. And this is just a distribution of the messaging. So you would get that in the masterclass if you sign up for that. But content is not usually the problem. When we have a problem, it's usually because these other three are broken or you are publishing the wrong content in on your platform. So let's quickly discuss the content that needs to be created. So we are going to jump into another part of another masterclass and we'll come back to this. Let's discuss the big, this biggest reason why many consulting firms and coaches as well as startups often see no ROI with their content marketing. And that is because a lot of time they get into the how to content, trying to produce tutorials, trying because this is what they were told you need to add value and they think that that is by doing how to content. But the reality is how to content doesn't translate into clients. And here is why. I have seen business owners of C suite executives of consulting and SaaS companies who are disillusioned with, with content. And when I review what they are doing, I quickly find a problem. Often because they are pu putting out tutorials to showcase their expertise, but they are not getting the clients. We've all drank from the Kool-Aid where we were told to give our best stuff away for free. Be people will pay for the implementation and you are going to build credibility and then they will rush to pay you, except the letter doesn't seem to come, right? That is because it's not the way to build an audience of buyers online. It is actually crippling your business. We will be back shortly with your episode. Right now, let's hear a quick word from today's episode sponsor. 
Are you looking for a simple way to start making sales? Then you'll want to check out our coaching program, Easy Sales Blueprint. Finally, an easy way to sell your program or service. Discover the simple steps to creating a lucrative coaching or consulting business. The Easy Sales Blueprint gives you a step-by-step -step method to easily make more sales without spending all day on social media, cold outreach, and hitting the door to try a good old-fashioned door-to-door sales system. Apply today by heading to tiny.cc slash get more sales to find out how we can help you achieve online sales success. Are you tired of living paycheck to paycheck? Do you dream of financial freedom? Are you tired of the rat race and would like more time with your loved one and friends? Making memories that will last you a lifetime? You may want to download Building a 20 Million Portfolio, How I Created Financial Freedom by Aurelia Amaka, a successful entrepreneur, founder of System IU, and author. So why not give it a try? Download Aurelia's book now and start building your own path to financial freedom by heading to tiny.cc slash freedom B. A sad reality is that you will notice that when you continuously create educational content, you attract a crowd of people that love and support your content, but not necessarily turn into clients. This will actually cause your income to dip or plateau, causes your, it will cause you to get stuck in the cycle of posting every day and not seeing any result, making you feel like you are giving away gold and people aren't paying attention. Raise your hand if you've been here. Yeah, I know I'm speaking to the church here. I'm preaching to the choir, so you know what I'm talking about here. Yeah. And even if you look at the major entrepreneurs who you notice have grown tremendously, things Gary V, think Grant Cardone, they do not produce how to content. Go and look at it. So if how to educational content was the most efficient way to grow your practice and consultancy in the digital space, then everyone doing it will be a lot further. They will probably have surpassed many of the people I just named, but we know that isn't the case. So how do you grow a business in the digital space and bring clients to your consulting or co coaching uh, business with content? You create content that pre-sells or offer by creating conceptual agreements with prospects. Any sales conversation subconsciously answers three main questions. Why this? Why not? Why you? If those aren't answered, it, it is often the underlying reason behind every objection. So what we do at Risk Digital is we infuse the answers to this into our content, therefore allowing it to do the selling for us. We call it infusion selling, where we infuse persuasive copywriting elements into the content so that at scale, we are having sales conversations through our content so that when people come to us, they're like, okay, girl, girl, what's up? Let's jump on the call, let's talk, yeah. You get me? So you have to understand that your content is one job and contrary to popular advice, it's not what you're saying. So it's not about the engagement, it's not about doing any of that. It's not about the engagement, content, likes, um, love thing. What it is about is about having that sales conversation with your prospects, right? So as we described content day, now you have an understanding of what the, what the content that you, what is the content that you need to be creating. But the reality is that it all comes down to understanding the sophistication of the buyer. So let me help you understand what is an, an unsophisticated buyer and a sophisticated buyer. An unsophisticated buyer has not encou encountered your solution or anything similar before. Whereas a sophisticated buyer has encountered similar solution and has tried different solution to no avail. And this, this will shape your narrative and messaging, which essentially are the foundation blocks your content is built upon. So let me give you a perfect example. If you are in the online space, even if you're not, there is a popular um, course creator known as Amy Porterfield. Now, 
you you if you know her that means you are in the online space for a long time and at a certain time you might have considered actually creating a digital course so at the time that you encountered maybe an ad from Amy Porterfield telling you about creating courses and making money from your knowledge like that, you were an unsophisticated buyer because you had never encountered that. Maybe this was the first time you were exposed to having an online business and the idea of having an online business and making money digitally online on the internet. Now, a sophisticated buyer would have encountered that, might have tried selling courses, did not work, maybe started coaching, they didn't like the idea of coaching people because they felt it was draining, and maybe went into having an agency. Or you might have started with having an SMA, you, you encountered Imad Gazi, and then you like, his idea of having an SMA is not working. I now want to have a SaaS for, SaaS for a service as a, a business, or I want to have more of a consulting firm. At this particular time, if you encounter an ad telling you about starting an SMA business and you're at a stage where you've passed that, the message will not hit you. Maybe what they have can help you, but because they are speaking to an unsophisticated target market, they exclude you immediately. And same thing with people with courses. And if you are getting hit with that, you're like, oh, I've tried that. It's not for me. So this is what we mean when we're talking about sophisticated and unsophisticated buyers. And as an entrepreneur, you need to be aware of who is your, who is your buyer and the level of sophistication in order to tailor your marketing around that. And this is often the biggest mistake that I see with a lot of businesses. And this is often what is broken because before we fix your content, before we fix your narrative, before we fix your messaging, we need to start with who is your ideal client. Because if we don't get who's the ideal client and we do not actually have a deeper understanding of the target market, whatever we do will be properly noise. And this is what I continuously say. Before we fix messaging, content, and narrative, this is the start because your product has to fit with what the target market wants. And this is often where there's a disconnect. And then afterward, then we have your narrative where it is why you, because it is a ton and a hundred of things on the world, probably the way to solve the same problem. And the thing is that most entrepreneurs make the mistake of thinking only of their competition, but there's also other competition. What is the alternative way to actually doing what you do instead of going to your competition? And there's also the option of not solving the problem. These four things are usually part of your narrative and that should be included eventually into your messaging. But most entrepreneurs are so focused on the competition that they don't think at all these other alternatives. This is why it leads to not getting sales. And this is the purpose of developing a clear narrative and messaging so that it speaks to your prospect and eliminates the alternative. And that's when this is done, this is the only way now that we can incorporate that into the content and then propel that through your content ecosystem and the content marketing ecosystem playbook so that your prospects get it and do business with you. So that is usually what is broken when we are talking about the marketing aspect. And all this forms part of your go-to-market. And if you are in tech, you understand what I'm talking about because this is part of your go-to-market. And most of the time, people are trying to solve the, the promotion part when these fund foundations are not in place. And this is why you have a problem where you are not getting as many clients getting in or you are getting clients getting in because the promotion is good, but they are not activated and they never end up using your product. And this, when that happened, that's what's broken. So we, in order to do all this and to sell through the promotion because we believe in mark that marketing is supposed to sell and is supposed to drive the, the the demand as well as sell to the market and this is we do this through the infusion selling approach and the infusion selling approach is a pragmatic approach that offers a transformative solution by blending the strengths of content writing and persuasive copywriting infusion selling it will allow you as a business to create engaging and impactful content that attracts, informs, 
and converts your target audience. So at the core, the infusion selling is captivating storytelling. And this is about narrative. And as you see, when we started, I told you two stories because that is captivating and it paints the picture of the problem that people are facing and how they should solve it. So I've painted that picture in your head and now you know about it. So in a noisy marketplace, storytelling serves as the golden thread that weaves connections between a brand and its audience by crafting compelling narratives that captivate and resonate with ideal clients businesses can forge deep emotional connections and position themselves as trusted authorities so and one thing i want you to take away from this short course is that infusion selling places a strong emphasis on, on an empowering messaging that invites dialogue and engagement. And I'm not talking about outward engagement where you have comments, uh, comments, likes, and stuff on social media. Those don't pay the bills. We can't bank that. But I'm talking about even the internal dialogue that the prospect needs to have. Because if you're having a conversation where you are eliminating the alternatives for them, not only just your competition, but all the other alternatives, it forces them to have a dialogue and engagement with themselves on how they are looking to solve that problem and why they should, they should solve that particular problem. And what we use in this is creating content that sparks conversation, encourages feedback, which is usually forcing them to ask questions, and fosters a sense of community around the brand. And with that, businesses will build trust, establish relationship, and ultimately drive consideration. And if you remember in part two of the, rev uh, the revenue acceleration series, I spoke about the buyer's journey and it was attraction, consideration, and conversion. And your content is supposed to attract, drive consideration, and also have most of the sales conversation so that only the 17% of time that they are ready to speak to, when they are finally ready to, to speak to you and they are in market, they are having that sales conversation. And now, in order for us to go further, I want us to understand this because once we have the foundation in place, now it's time to scale. And while there are a lot of things that goes into scaling, the core principle and essence of scaling entails building your pipeline, basically how you're going to create demand to get the market attention, conversion system, the sales process that gets them to say yes for tech product, you need to be getting them to trial or sign up and also activate them, and then your product suite. How you, what offers you are bringing them into. And this is very important because in order to scale, you are doing more at the upfront, in the, at the top of your funnel, at the top of your pipeline to get more in the back end. So how do you do more of at the front to get more at the back? It's simple. There are three ways to scale. It's through paid media, paid advertising, organic content as well sales outreach so let me walk you through paid media you go you pay ads you you buy ads get um ads and then get more people through the front end but you have the problem with that because you don't have any brand affinity you don't have any brand equity with the people that are seeing your ads they need to see your message a lot more before they interact and decide to make a purchasing decision which drives up your cost your customer cost of acquisition and also because there's still not enough trust, if let's say you are selling a high ticket product, it is not as easy to get them into the door. Secondly, you have outreach where you have sales development, actually engage people, cold outreach, cold DMs. Usually have low conversions because as similarly to paid ads, no trust, no brand equity. I don't really know you like that. I don't trust that you can deliver. So it takes you building a lot of time, building relationships for a long time, which means that it has long sales cycles with the, the, the customers on the other end. Then you have content, which is usually a triple threat, where you not only build trust, no lack of trust and respect, but also you build that brand affinity with them so that by the time you, when you are making invitations, those that are really in the market are like, okay, I trust Tanya, I trust Lydia, I trust uh, this company, so I'm going to 
go with them. So there's a difference. And this is usually why even when I see startups raise money and start throwing money at ads and then complain later that they've burned some, all the money in ads and they didn't get a lot of customers into the door, this is usually the reason why, because they have no brand affinity and no brand equity in the market. And people are like, who the hell are you? So here's why most of our clients get the best results with organic client um, content, and we do as well, is we create connect um, content that is connected to the sales process. So we understand that each piece of content is meeting prospects on a certain part of the buyer's journey, and its role is to help them move through the sales pipeline acting like ads. So when you turn your content and are aware that your content is supposed to create ROI in terms of revenue, you not just create content for the sake of creating content, but you create content to move them through the journey, which is usually your top of the funnel middle of the final content and bottom of the final content. And this is usually how we create content even for our clients. Then we understand that the content is about visibility. So this is why we have created a content marketing ecosystem that has a role to capture attention on social media to eventually get them into your world to engulf them with your messaging. If you look at how what I do, I capture attention on social media. will drive people either to my podcast, either to YouTube or to my email list because eventually what that does somebody watching my youtube might actually decide to sign up for my for a free the free master class and now they are in the newsletter they now start receiving our emails with article for from our publication and then they receive from blogs posts from our other websites then we, they receive content they receive email and we are engulfing people in our marketing then we have narrative, where it is having a distinguishable narrative from everyone else in the market so that it can stand up in the sea of feminists. If you understand what I often say is that I don't believe that content that drive, uh, that is highly engaged on, on social media drives um, revenue. And I also say that I don't believe that how to content drives revenue. Like now I'm not giving you how to content. I'm walking you through how we do things and our perspective. So it's completely different. It's still educational, but it is not how to content. And this is our narrative. And we, we have a narrative that content should have a return on investment financially. We have, our narrative has different aspects of that it should do most of the sales for you. So having a clear narrative and building stories around it and building stories and narratives and building your brand around that and driving that will make a difference with your content. And then we have the sale process, which is part of the, the message or a messaging framework, which is infusion selling, where we infuse um, where we have the sales messaging that is infused into the content that makes handing off be, hand off between marketing and sales seamless. And this is often what a lot of businesses have as a problem, where that handoff between marketing and sales is, there's a lot of friction making it very difficult. Like for me, for example, we do a lot of close by chat. I love closing by chat uh, through DMs or qualifying people through the DMs. So that is important for us. And so we seamlessly end people over like that into a sales process. Make sense? And if everything that I've said makes sense for you, then this is what we do with clients. And I'd love to extend an invitation to you to allow us to partner with you. But before you even decided, allow me to disqualify yourself because we are not the best fit for everybody. Okay, so we are a match made in business haven. If you are a tech startup and tech consultancy who are the growth stage post revenue or fundraising that is seeking to launch a new product or enter a new market, yes, you are our favorite people. We, we work with you on the consultancy part where we have our go to market agency. And then if you are a consultancy co company, a uh, coaching company, not lifestyle coaches, but coaches with teams building a company looking to transition from a personal brand to a company brand an agency or an advisory already at six figures, usually multi six figures, um, seven figures in South African rent and want to triple that in the next six to 12 months. We are looking to work with you on our advisory side. And then if you are eager to achieve brand recognition, optimum product adoption, activation and revenue growth, and eventually you also, you want to, to attract, nurture and close more 
clients, then you we invite you to book a consultation with my team and I in the description box. And if you're like, well, Tanya, I'm not there yet and I feel left out, I'm not leaving you out. We have the Business Create Insider, which is a membership. And within the membership, we still host workshops for people in the community. And when we have different people from different parts of the world helping you with building your business. And we have the Business Insider Vault, where we add resources, master classes that will help you build your business that never make it to the outside world. And it is just for you because I know that when I was also smaller and I was starting out, I really wanted this type of resources. So you can sign up through that to actually get those. And we are building a community where we are hoping to bring the tech startup world and the digital online space together so that they can collaborate together. So we are looking forward to having you today and have so much fun with you today. So on this note, hope you enjoyed this final installment. Um, let me know in the comments, what do you think? Is there something that you're going to be implementing? Is there something that it, made, it gave you a, it does give you a haha moment? Let me know your haha moment. And if you're listening to it on a podcast, leave us a review. We would really appreciate that. On Apple Podcasts, let us know what you're enjoying on podcast. And leave us reviews, rate our podcast, subscribe to this channel, like this video, and it helps with the algorithm and getting this type of content in front of other business owners just like you because sharing is caring. On this note, I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.